can be blessed. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's, it's really good to see you all here. And I know this topic of the, the Godhead is a really hot topic at the moment. Um, and it's, a, unfortunately, a very controversial one. Particularly seeing very recently we've had certain individuals from America over here sharing their um, perspective on things. And it's likely that many of you have been confronted with different ideas about God and you have questions in your minds and you want to have answers. So today I want to share with you some of my journey, my story, with the hope that it will help you understand in your journey about God. Before we start, I just want to say a word of prayer. Brian's already prayed, but I just want to pray and dedicate myself to the Lord this way. So please bow with me. Father God, Lord, we just pray that you'll be with us now as we explore this, this deep, deep topic of the Godhead. And Lord, I feel very in, insufficient at this moment to, to share this. There, you know, how can we as, as created beings think to understand God? I just pray that you will, you will stand here and speak and that it will be not my words but your words. And we ask this, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So I don't claim to have to be any kind of authority on the Godhead. I'm just a fellow traveller with you. But I have had the unique experience of being in both sides of the camp. I just pray that as um, I share with these things with you, as I share with you my experience, my journey, that you will learn something from my experience and, and not make the same mistakes that I made. This is why I wrote my book. Here it is. It's hot off the press, first edition. Um, it's, over, it's been over 10 years in the making. But why write another book on the Godhead? I believe this book is unique in two ways. Firstly, it's my personal journey. It documents the evidence that the Lord showed me as I sought to understand the truth about God. And so it's really my testimony, you could say. And secondly, it's written by someone who's, who has been an anti-Trinitarian and therefore I, have the, I can see things from their perspective, if you know what I mean. Uh, often when I read books about the Godhead, sometimes their arguments didn't make sense to me because they were coming at it from a different angle. Now, I have a confession to make. The title is Understanding the Godhead. The more I study about the Godhead, the less I feel like I understand God, if you know what I mean. The more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. But this picture that you see here of light coming into a canyon really sums up my experience. Because figuratively speaking, why we're here on this earth, we're all down in this dark canyon. Not until we are translated will we will be able to bask in the undimmed rays of the glory of God. Till then, there are many things we must accept by faith. This, this book has been reviewed by Pastor Athel Tolhurst, who was the former Undersecretary of the General Conference, who has since passed away. His insight was greatly appreciated, and he's also written the foreword for this book, of which I'm very grateful. So let me now take you back on a bit of a journey just to show you my background, where I came from. I was raised by God-fearing Seventh-day Adventist parents. In fact, I'm third generation. And I want to pause here to acknowledge the amazing job that my parents did in raising me. If it wasn't for their hard work, I, wouldn't, I would not be standing here before you today, I can assure you. But I was raised believing the traditional understanding, the traditional view of the Godhead, which the church holds today. Three eternal persons, self-existent in one Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in the early days, I never really studied these things for myself. I just accepted it because my church taught it. That's what my parents taught me. And I just believed it. Then in my teens... My family were introduced to this non-Trinitarian view of God. In this teaching, God the Father was the supreme God, self-existent, eternal. The Son was also God, but he was a lesser God in some way. 
He was literally begotten or brought into existence by the Father. Far back in the ages of eternity, and he inherited all the titles of deity from his Father. The Holy Spirit was not a person like the Father and the Son, but he was but the Holy Spirit was the spirit, mind, and power of the Father and the Son. I resisted the idea at first. It just didn't seem right to me. But I studied it, I studied it, and listening to, to lots of videos, DVDs, um, studying with friends. It, was, it didn't happen overnight. It was a long process. Eventually, my whole family changed our view to the anti-Trinitarian view of God. And I became a staunch anti-Trinitarian. And I used to love to debate with people. I used to get on internet forums and share my ideas, and many people couldn't answer my arguments. I thought I was closer to God because the anti-Trinitarian concept of God seemed to help me to understand God more. It appealed to my emotions more. Um, the, the literal father-son um, rela um, relationship was more realistic to my human understanding. And I thought it seemed to help me understand the greatness of God's sacrifice. But it didn't last. After the novelty of this whole idea, this new belief wore off, I found myself no different spiritually than I was before. In fact, it developed a critical spirit in me of the church and of others, and it actually ended up dragging me down spiritually. And then there was those nagging problems in the back of my mind. Problems like clear Bible and spiritual prophecy statements that just didn't fit. Um, even we had to explain them away as less clear state with, with less clear statements, or we had to we had to say that the quotes had been tampered with. And then there was El that's Ellen White's statement where Ellen White says that the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery, and here we were trying to explain it. And then this it was claimed that this teaching brought people closer to God. In fact, this is one of the main arguments that it, it brings forward today, that you, can, that you can relate to him better when you believe this doctrine. They will say that believing in a three-person Godhead means that you believe in a make-up gospel, an artificial gospel. And they will say that if you accept their teaching, the teaching of what's called the One True God movement, is what they're calling it now, that it will take your relationship with God to the next level. This is what that they teach. And this is what... I believed that it would do for me. But I did not see any proof of this in the lives of the people that held this doctrine. True, I saw many people that were godly and, and sincere in their belief, but I saw many people who were very dogmatic and unchristlike in their behavior. And then I looked at the youth of the people that believed this doctrine, and many of them were just as worldly as their more liberal counterparts. In my own life, I first thought I was closer to God, but as I said, it was short-lived. And I met many, many sincere, upright, godly people who believed in a three-person Godhead, much more, in fact, than were in the one true God belief. So all these problems, all these, these problems combined with some providential circumstances that brought me in close connection and association with some godly people who believed in the three eternal persons of the Godhead. And the ideas that they shared with me really challenged my view on God and sent me back to the drawing board to study this topic for myself. Now, there is a rumor going around, and that is that I was desperate to get married. <laughs> and, and I wanted to marry, and the person I wanted to marry was a Trinitarian. And so I changed my belief to accommodate her. Now, I want to set the record straight that that is not true. My wife-to-be had nothing to do with me changing my belief. In fact, I changed my belief before I fell in love with Hannah. By the way, it's Hannah's birthday today. <laughs> so happy birthday, dear. <laughs> in fact, it was one of my Bible teachers at the school I was attending at Highwood that really impacted me the most. If it was not for his um, wisdom and encouragement and insight... I definitely wouldn't have even started on this journey that I, that I started. 
So I'm going to share with you some truths that the Lord taught me um, in my in my search for truth. During this talk, I'm going to be quoting a lot from the writings of Ellen White. And I believe that Ellen White is inspired of God. And I believe that in these last days, the Lord gave the church the gift of prophecy because of all the winds of doctrine that were blowing, that we would need the extra guidance. However, the Bible will be the basis of our discussion today. So tighten your seatbelts as we go into a journey back in time, far beyond time, in fact, to a point that we don't know, back into in time to ask the question, who is God? But first, we need to realize that the ground that we're about to tread is holy ground. And as I studied this topic, I came face to face with my own inability to understand God. How can we, the creation, think that we can understand God, the creator? In fact, Charles Wesley once said, You show me a worm that understands man, and I will show you a man that understands God. And I think he was pretty right, don't you? But this was a tough pill for me to swallow in the early days. Because you see, I wanted all my questions answered. Don't we all? We want our questions answered. But I had to come to the realization that some things are simply not revealed. Some things we have to accept by faith. We need, we, and most of all, we need God to guide us in this matter. Listen to this statement here by Sister White. The most humbling lesson that man has to learn is the nothingness of human wisdom and the folly of trying by his own unaided efforts to find out God. He may exert his intellectual powers to the uttermost. He may have what the world calls a superior education. Yet he still may be ignorant in God's eyes. So without the aid of the Holy Spirit, all our efforts in this regard are going to be nothingness. If you only remember one thing from this talk today, I want you to remember this. Don't ever think that all your questions about God are going to be answered. The very fact that there are unanswered questions about God proves that God is God and that we are human. In fact, this, I believe, is one of the major flaws in the One True God movement. They're trying to explain things about God that are simply not revealed. Here are some examples. Why is Jesus called the Son of God? We're, we're given, we are given a few clues, which we will look at later on. But the One True God movement tries to explain this by saying that Jesus was literally born of God in eternity past. But God has not given us any clear light regarding Jesus' sonship in eternity past. We are told that he is the eternal Son. and We need to accept this by faith. Secondly, how can Jesus be God and yet die? We're told that Jesus laid down his life. How is this possible? We're not told. Anti-Trinitarians will try and say that Jesus is not eternal God and therefore the Father could just take his life away from him and, and in the same way that he gave it to him in the beginning. But once again, we have no clear biblical evidence that's, that tells us this. And we'll talk about this more later. And then there is, what is the nature of the Holy Spirit? Once again, we'll talk about this later, but the One True God movement tells us that the Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ. But we're told the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. So isn't that trying to define the nature of the Holy Spirit by saying he's the mind of Christ? And then we have God's eternal existence. Now this boggles our minds. We cannot understand God. How can God be eternal in both directions? This we must accept by faith. You see, God has not revealed to us everything that there is to know about him. God only reveals that which is important for us in the plan of redemption. In fact, Ellen White tells us that the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan, the restoration of the human soul in the image of God. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field of study. He has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word. And this is another very important principle that we need to understand when we study the Godhead. And that is that God only reveals that which is important for our salvation. All the names of God in the Bible are given to us to reveal something about the plan of redemption. That is the focus. So in my quest to understand 
God, there were three key questions that I had to set straight in my mind. First one was, is Christ eternal God like the Father? Secondly, is the Holy Spirit an individual person in his own right? And thirdly, is the Godhead part of the pillars of our faith, which the Lord led the church to establish in the beginning? I'm going to try and cover the first two points in this session. We'll see how we go. If we could answer these three questions definitively, we could put this Godhead debate to rest. So let's look at the first one. Is Christ the eternal God like the Father? Studying through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I found Jesus very clearly portrayed as God. Even as an anti-Trinitarian, I firmly believed that Jesus was God. So the key question is not, is Jesus God? This is a, a question that both sides agree on. The question is, what does it mean to be God? What does the title of God mean? This is what I, need to answer, I needed to answer. And in my study, I discovered two key attributes that separate God from all other beings in the universe. And they are, number one, that he is creator and sustainer of all life. God made everything and he sustains everything moment by moment. And secondly, that he is eternal existent. In other words, he had no beginning. God exists independent of time, space and matter. He has always existed. So let's start by looking at what God has to say about his creative power. When we open the Bible, the very first thing that God wants us to know about himself is the fact that he is our creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is a fact that the Bible writers understood that creation, creating the world, was a key attribute of God. In fact, when the Bible writers were seeking to establish the divinity of Christ, this was often the first place they went to. And here are a couple of examples. John 1, 1 and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And Colossians 1 16 and 18. By him, Christ, were all things created that were in heaven, that were in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Christ is our creator. And if Christ created all things, isn't it fair to say that he would sustain us moment by moment? If his power brought us into existence, could not his power sustain us? Well, let's prove this from inspiration. Colossians 1, 17. He, Christ, was before all things, and by him do all things consist. And John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Listen to Spirit of Prophecy. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are recipients of the life of the Son of God. However able and talented, however large their capacities, they are replenished from, with life from the source of all life. He is the spring, the fountain of life. Only he who alone hath immortality, dwelling in light and life, can say, I have power to lay down my life and power to take it again. So this quote tells us two things. Number one, Jesus is the source of all life. And secondly, that Jesus had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it again. Why am I emphasizing this? One of the fundamental teachings of the One True God movement is that is summed up in its title, One True God, implying that Jesus is not the One True God, that he's in some way a lesser God than the Father. And here is the main difference. They believe that Christ derived his life at some point from the Father. Therefore, the only truly self-existent one is the Father. But I've just shown you three inspired statements that clearly show that Jesus is the source of all life. And there's more. In fact, one of my favorites is Desire of Ages, page 530. Now, this was a groundbreaking statement for our pioneers when it first came out. In fact, when M.L. Andreessen read this statement, he didn't believe that Ellen White wrote it. So he went to Ellen White's own archives and looked it up and he found that she had indeed written it. And here it is. Jesus declared, I am, note that word, I am the resurrection and the life. 
In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Now think about that last sentence. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Now if we lessen the divinity of Christ in any way, if we say that he is a lesser God than the Father, then what are we doing? Aren't we in jeopardizing our own eternal life? This quote tells us two very important things about God. Number one, that he is the I am. And we're going to talk about the I am as we go along. You see, I, I thought when I was a anti-Trinitarian that I believed that Jesus was God in every, every sense of the word. But when you start crunching the numbers, you realize that it actually doesn't add up. Here's why. This statement clearly links Jesus' divinity with his eternal existence. Can you see that? Ellen White is using three, what she is in this statement, three words, all meaning very similar things, to describe the life of Christ. Now, what does original mean? Original means, and, and by the way, these quotes, these definitions come from Webster's 1828 dictionary, which is a good dictionary to use when you're studying Ellen White because it's written in her era. So, you know, English language changes over the years, but this is close to her era. This is in her era. Original means the fountain, the source, the cause, that which anything primarily precedes. And unborrowed is not borrowed, genuine, original, native, one's own. And underived means not derived, not received from any foreign source. Ellen White is placing triple emphasis on the fact that Jesus' life did not come from someone else. In other words, he is the source of all life. He is God in every sense of the word. Now, if Jesus' life really did come from the Father, why on earth would God write something like that which, to confuse us? This statement shows us that in order for Christ to be fully divine, he needs to be eternal. Otherwise, you may as well class Christ with all the other angels and other created beings. As an anti trinitarian I'd read this statement many, many times. And we tried to explain it away by reading this statement here. In him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given to him as a free gift if we will believe in Christ as his personal saviour. So they say, see, Christ, we can receive it, original, unborrowed, underived life too. So if Christ can receive it, why can't we? Sorry, if we can receive it, why can't Christ? But hang on, is it really original, unborrowed, and underived life when we have it? Does this make any sense? Let's dig into this quote a little bit more and see what we can find. Let me read to you the rest of the quote. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The Word which was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something here which each individual receives. It is not eternal nor immortal, for God, the life giver, takes it back again. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was what? Unborrowed. No man can take his life from him. I lay it down of myself, he said. In him was life original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given to him as a free gift if he will believe in Christ as his personal saviour. So Ellen White is actually contrasting our life, which is not original, borrowed from Christ, with Christ's life, who is original, unborrowed, underived. Take a look at this. Christ has immortality. And I've color coded the quote down here so you can see where, where it's talking about Christ and where it's talking about us. Christ has immortality. Man does not have immortality. The life of Christ was unborrowed. Man can possess this life only through Christ. In other words, it's borrowed. No one can take his life from him. And at death, God, the life giver, takes our life back again. In Christ, 
is life original, unborrowed, underived? And this life is not inherent in man. It was inherent in Christ, wasn't it? Our life is conditional. God's, Christ's life was unconditional. Can you see that? Nowhere in the quote does it tell us that the life of Christ was borrowed. In fact, it says it's unborrowed. This so-called proof text actually proves the opposite. But don't take my word for it. Let the prophet speak. From Jesus is our life derived. In him is life that is original, unborrowed, underived. In him is the fountain of life. In us is the streamlet from the fountain. Our life is something we receive, something the giver takes back to himself again. So there you have it, plain and simple. Our life equals derived. Christ's life equals underived. When I read this quote, it really made me stop and think as I was studying this because one of the main problems that I see as I look over both sides of this debate is that the anti-Trinitarians have to cherry-pick spirit of prophecy, picking out the ones that suit their agenda, and then they use those less clear statements to explain the really clear ones. But this is not good scholarship, is it? We need to be able to find harmony throughout inspiration. There is much more evidence that I could share with you, but we must move on for the sake of time. But the key thought here is that for Christ to be our creator and our sustainer, he must be eternal. His life is original, unborrowed, underived. He is eternal God. And so far we've looked at one aspect of God's creative power, and there is a lot more that we could go into. We don't have time to talk about Christ's power over death. But I show clearly in my book that Christ had the power to lay down his life and to take it again. This is just one more clear evidence that Jesus is God in every sense of the word. How God can lay his life down and take it again, we can't understand. But that's not for us to worry about. Let's now talk about another aspect of God, and that is his eternal existence. The Bible tells us, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God is eternal. This is perhaps the most basic, fundamental principle that separates God from every other created being. We cannot understand it. We must accept it by faith. There was never a time when God was not. In fact, the Hebrew word for Jehovah comes from the root word Hayah, which simply means to exist. So the most fundamental attribute that separates God from every other being is the fact that he exists. To deny the eternal existence of God is to deny that he is God. No one disputes that this applies to God the Father. The question is, does this apply to Christ? The one true God movement says no, because they believe that Christ derived his life at some point from the Father. So what does the Bible say about Christ's existence? I needed to clear this up, so I spent a lot of time studying the divinity of Christ. I'm going to share with you a few highlights. If you want more, you'll have to read the book. Let's start by looking at this word, Hayah, and see how it applies to Christ. We're going to start with Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and told Moses to go and lead Israel, Moses asked God, what is your name? So that I can tell Israel, what is your name? And this is what God said. God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent thee unto you. Now this, I am, this word I am is a very, very important word. It became one of the key names of God for Israel. In fact, the Hebrew word, the word I am, is Hayah. That's, that, that's the word translated in English, I am, is Hayah, which is the root word for Jehovah. This word appears three times in this verse. And an alternative rendering for I am that I am is I myself am. I exist. That is the substance of who I am. Now the question is, who was it that spoke to Moses at the burning bush? Was it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Well, let's see it from the Spirit of Prophecy. In the burning bush, which, who? Christ appeared to Moses, revealed God. 
The symbol chosen for the representation of the deity was a lowly shrub that seemingly had no attractions. This enshrined the infinite. The all-merciful God shrouded his glory in a most humble type that Moses could look upon it and live. So Christ was to come in the body of our humiliation in the likeness of men. In the eyes of the world he possessed no beauty that they could desire him. Yet he was what? The incarnate God, the light of heaven and earth. His glory was veiled. His greatness and majesty were hidden that he might draw near to sorrowful, tempted man. So this burning bush represented Christ. This humble bush enshrined the great I Am. And that I Am was Christ. He is no less a God than the Father. And this statement clearly shows this. So the key I want you to remember here is that I Am represents eternal existence. This is the hallmark of God. This is the original, unborrowed, underived life of Christ. Come with me to the New Testament. And here, a thousand or so years later, when Christ was incarnate, he had a very interesting exchange with the Jewish leaders, which, in which Christ really confirms this truth we've just read. The Jews were comparing Christ to Abraham, and they said, Art thou greater than our father Abraham? Notice Jesus' response. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, Thou art not fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And then they took up stones to cast at him. Now tell me, why did they pick up stones to cast at him at that moment? He, he was said he was God, that's right. He had said a lot of things that, that really irritated them before then. They could have thrown stones at him many times. But at that point, when he used that word, I am, those Hebrews knew what he was talking about. They knew that I am is the eternal God. Now notice this. Commenting on this verse, Ellen White says, Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to what? Express the idea of eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. He had announced himself to be the self-existent one. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth has been from old, from the days of eternity. Can inspiration say it any clearer? Jesus stood before those Jews and he said, I am the eternal self-existent God. Now, if Christ was self-existent, that puts him equal with God in every sense of the word. He does not owe his existence to the Father. He is eternal. Now, notice how Ellen White links I am and self-existence with Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though they be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come to me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth has been from old, from everlasting, or, as the margin says, from the days of eternity. Now, how many days are in eternity? Lots. Never ending, exactly. But if it says from eternity, what does that mean? Isn't that eternity in the past? Eternity in the future boggles our memory. But eternity in the past does not even compute with me. But that's God. He is far above our understanding. Now, here are a few more statements about Christ's eternal existence. From all eternity, Christ was united with the Father. And when he took upon himself human nature, he was still one with God. He was the link that unites God with humanity. Now, some anti-Trinitarians affirm that Jesus was begotten or birthed by the Father back in the ages of eternity. And they, they claim that eternity is this invisible line that we can't see beyond. And then Christ was, was, came into existence inside eternity and he came out from behind eternity and, and here he is eternal. But this quote tells us that Christ was from all eternity. Now, this is not just some of eternity, if that's even possible, if it's even possible to have some of eternity. But all means all, without beginning. This next one is really amazing. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and death. These wonderfully solemn and significant statements. 
It was the source of all mercy, pardon and peace and grace, the self-existent, eternal, unchangeable one who appeared to his exiled servant on the isle that is called Patmos. So here it is again. Christ is self-existent and eternal. Can the English language say it any clearer? Jesus says, I, when Jesus says, I am he that liveth, he's saying, I am that I am. I myself exist. So the eternal, self-existent one died, rose from the dead, and because of that, he has the keys of hell and death. If God raised him from the dead, how does that give him the keys of hell and death? So far, I've shared with you just a selection from what's in my book. But we need to move on. Now, the question is, how do anti-Trinitarians, the one true God movement, how do they explain these clear statements? Well, they say that, that God that Jesus inherited the titles of divinity from his Father. So Jesus is self-existent because of his Father. Now, but this argument makes no sense when you think about it. Now, if, if my father was 30 years old when I was born, can I say that I'm 60 years old when I'm actually only 30? You do not inherit your age from your parents, do you? Now, God would not ask us to believe something that's illogical as this, would he? But to back up this idea of Christ inheriting all things from the Father, they will quote this verse here. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, to back up this idea. And it says that God hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. And verse 4, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So let's dig into this quote. What, what does this verse really mean when he says that he was heir of all things and he obtained a more excellent name than the angels? To understand this quote, we need to understand the time frame that Paul is speaking. So let's look through the chapter and see what we can find. Verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, verse 1 is obviously post-incarnation. Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. And this verse here, it, we're not sure because it says both. It has pre-incarnation and post. And verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm moving quickly, guys, because I've got a lot to cover. Well, once again, we have both post and pre-incarnation here. So let's keep going and see if we can understand where this is going. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And here's the key verse, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be unto him a father, and he will be to me a son. So Paul is actually quoting here from Psalms chapter 2. So in order to understand the time frame that Paul is speaking, we need to understand the context of Psalms chapter 2. So let's go to Psalms chapter 2 and see what we can find. Verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, at what time, what point did the kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel and raise themselves up against Christ through and God? Far back in the ages of eternity? No, definitely not. What about at Calvary? That's the only time that wicked men got their hands on Christ. With that in mind, let's keep reading. Let us break, saying, let us break their bands asunder, let us cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. And he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now in the context of this verse, when was Christ set as the king on majesty on high? What about when he ascended back to heaven after he had been incarnate? Well, let's keep reading the next verse. 
I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, in the context of this reading, when do you think the Father spoke these words to Christ? Far back in the ages of eternity? Doesn't fit the context, does it? The context is obviously post-incarnation. So let's look at the next verse and see what we can see. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine what? Inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now there's our word, inheritance. This is the word we're trying to understand in Hebrews chapter 1. Has anyone picked up any similarities between Hebrews chapter 1 and Psalms chapter 2? Well, if you haven't, let me show you. Both chapters are speaking about the same event. One is a prophecy. The other is speaking in hindsight. And here's what's happening. Christ has came to this earth as a man. The kings of the earth set themselves against him, against God through the person of Jesus Christ. They killed him, put him on the tomb, and put guards there to keep him in place. But God in heaven laughed at them, prophetic, poetically speaking. He put their plans to naught by sending an angel to, to raise Christ from the dead, or to call Christ from the dead. In the tomb. Christ ascended back to heaven as king of the holy hill of Zion, and then the Father declared, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, what was Christ's inheritance? His inheritance, what made Jesus so much better than the angels? Psalms chapter 2, verse 8 tells us that it was the heathen. And the world, that was his inheritance. When Christ died, he brought back the earth from Satan's dominion. And he won many of the heathen because of his sacrifice back to to God. This was what made Christ so much better than the angels. This is what amazed the angels. The angels, when they saw Christ come and live as a man and die, they suddenly realized what Christ was really like, what God was really like. And this is what made Christ so much better than the angels in their minds. But we need some more evidence to set this in concrete. So let's go to the New Testament now. In Acts chapter 13, verse 33, we find Peter quoting from Acts, um, from Psalms chapter 2, and he says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, we, so Peter sets the context of Psalms chapter 2 as the, during the resurrection. And Paul does the same thing in Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And one more evidence to show that, that this is true is from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 3, page 179. Ellen White quotes, Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and then she says, Roman guards and Roman arms were powerless to confine the Lord of life within the narrow enclosure of the sepulchre. Christ had declared that he had power to lay down his life and power to take it again, and the hour of victory was near. So clearly, this verse here in Hebrews chapter 1 is not what the anti-Trinitarians would like us to believe. It has nothing to do with Christ inheriting all the aspects of deity from his Father in eternity past. This is clearly talking about when Christ ascended back to heaven and he was reinstated with his former position with the Father. Now Christ was literally the Son of God through the incarnation, through his birth into the human race. Now the Father could say, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And, but there's more. We haven't had time to cover the rest of that verse. But my, you, I don't have time to cover that now, so you'll have to get the book. So the evidence that we've looked at so far clearly ties the Christ's titles of begotten and son of God with the resurrection. So let's look at this son, this word son, a bit more and see what we can understand. As an anti-Trinitarian, I used to put a lot of weight on this word son. In fact, whenever I would read the word son... That automatically meant begotten by the Father or birthed by the Father in the ages of eternity. That's what anti-Trinitarians think when they read the word son in the Bible. 
What does this son really mean? This is the question I need to ask. I need to answer. Question. Are names in the Bible significant? Very significant. We look at, for example, the, the name Daniel. It means God is my judge. And the book of Daniel is all about judgment. And Jacob, the name Jacob means supplanter or deceiver. But after he was converted, God changed his name to Israel, the overcomer. So name tells us about a person's characteristics, who they are, and what their role is. This is what this is names in the Bible are very significant. But what about the names of God? Do you think the names of God teach us something about him? Most definitely. In fact, there are over a hundred names in the Bible for Christ. And every one of them tells us something about the plan of redemption. And here's just a few. Why should Christ's name of Son be any different? This is the question we need to ask. The name Son and Begotten, why should they be any different? Why should they not tell us something about the plan of redemption? The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, does this mean that, that, that Jesus was slain at the foundation of the world? Or before the foundation of the world? No, obviously not. But this lamb related to Jesus' sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. This highlights an important principle of how God works. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages 606, God counts things which are not as though they were. And he sees the end from the beginning and beholds the result of his work as though it were now accomplished. God often speaks about things in the future as though they are current. Isn't that interesting? Could this apply to Jesus' sonship? Because Ellen White is very clear that Christ is the eternal Son of God. Take a look at this quote here. The Word existed as the divine being, even as the eternal Son of God, in union and oneness with his Father. From everlasting, he was the mediator of the covenant, the one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accepted him, were to be blessed. So according to this statement, Christ has always been the Son of God. Now, anti-Trinitarians will try and twist this and say that this is just referring to eternity in the future, not eternity in the past. But this is doing violence to the meaning of the sentence. If I said Adam existed as the eternal man, what am I saying? Am I, aren't I saying that he is he's always existed? Which, of course, is completely false. But if, I, but if Spirit of Prophecy says that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, then that's exactly what she means. And, and not only that, she says that from everlasting, so from everlasting in the past, he was the mediator of the covenant. Now, question, how could Jesus be the mediator of the covenant from everlasting? How could he be the mediator of the covenant before sin? Who was he mediating with from everlasting? Well, Ellen White explains in the next paragraph, Christ was appointed the office of mediator from the creation of God, set up from everlasting to be our substitute and surety. So long before sin, in fact, from everlasting, from eternity past, Christ was appointed the office of mediator, as surety of the work that he would accomplish when the plan of redemption came into effect. When men fell, Christ took up the office of mediator that he had already been from everlasting. First it was a promise and a pledge of what would happen in the future. And then it became reality when the time was right. Before there was sin, there was a saviour. Amen? In fact, we're told very clearly that the plan of redemption itself is eternal. Take a look at this. All these statements here, I don't have time to read them all, but they, if you look at the marginal rendering for the, the word secret or hidden, or beginning, they all mean eternal. And Ellen White confirms this when she, she quotes Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, when she says that the plan of redemption was that which was kept silent through times eternal. She's using the marginal rendering here of the verse. And then she says in the next paragraph that the purpose and plan of grace has existed from all eternity. And that the plan of redemption is not an afterthought, a bit further down in the paragraph, formulated at the fall of Adam, but was an eternal purpose. An eternal purpose. And another quick statement. 
the, the plan of redemption has existed from all eternity and it is called the everlasting covenant. So surely as there was never a time when God was not, so surely there was never a moment when it was not the delight of the eternal mind to manifest his grace to humanity. So the, re- the plan of redemption is eternal as God himself. Question, can we have an eternal plan of redemption, one that has always existed without an eternal saviour? doesn't make sense, does it? What if the Father formed the plan of redemption in eternity past and then birthed the Son to fulfill the plan of redemption? What does that do to the Father's motives? It doesn't look good, does it? And, and, and then what if we take this logic a bit further and say, all right, the Father brought forth the Son to fulfill the plan of redemption. What if that, that plan of redemption failed? Do you think... Christ, the Father could have brought forth another son and tried again? Like, you could take this logic, you know, to the extreme if you wanted to. And another question, why did not God go himself? Why did he send his son? If God was really loved the world that much, why did not he go himself? But the fact is that God did go himself because Jesus is God in every sense of the word. So if the plan of redemption is eternal then Christ, who is the centre of it, must also be eternal. And this helps us to understand why Christ is called the eternal Son of God. In the same way that Christ was, has always been the Saviour from everlasting, he has also been this, always been the Son as token of this. How much greater does the sacrifice of Christ appear when you realise that, that the, the relationship between the Father and the Son is eternal? It's never been broken. It's always been in existence. It's far superior than any father and son relationship that has existed here on earth. Or as Ellen White puts it, that there was a sundering of divine powers on the cross. This puts the the, the, the sacrifice of Christ at a whole new level. So is back to our key question, is Christ eternal God like the Father? I've shared with you a small selection of evidence in my book. But I think the answer is very clear. The answer is yes. So let's quickly move on now to talk about the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit an individual person in his own right? Now this topic of the Holy Spirit is perhaps the most debated and controversial topic of all. And the reason is, is because the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. It's not revealed. I hope you're very familiar with this quote, and if you're not, you need to be, because it highlights a very important principle regarding the nature of the Holy Spirit. And it says, it is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. Now note that point, because we're going to come back to it. He will not speak of himself. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views bring passages of Scripture and put a human construction upon them, but the acceptance of these views will what? Not strengthen the church. Now, who's seen that? Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. Now, I just want to pull out a few points here. It is not essential for us to be able to define what the, what the Holy Spirit is. So please do not argue about the nature of the Holy Spirit. It's not essential for us to define it. Secondly, in his work of guiding men to truth, he will not speak of himself. Now tell me, according to this quote, who is it that guides us into all truth? The Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself, what truth would he reveal to us? The truth about Christ, right? Christ is the truth, isn't he not? The Bible tells us Christ is the truth. So the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He speaks of Christ. Note that. Secondly, we're told the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. The Lord has not revealed it. And I think both sides of this debate need to be really careful not to forget this fact. Anti-Trinitarians will say that the Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ. But isn't that defining the nature of the Holy Spirit? And I've heard Trinitarians, on the other hand, imply that the Holy Spirit is exactly like the Father and Son in every, in every sense. Now, we don't know. We're not told. 
So we need to be careful when we start defining what the Holy Spirit is. Acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Now, how many churches have been split over this issue? How many Adventists are leaving the church, either having their names removed themselves or being disfellowshipped because of this issue? Regarding such mysteries, silence is golden. So, th Does this mean that we should say nothing about the Holy Spirit? Well, let's read the next paragraph. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he said he, when he is to come, he would reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin. Now, what does it say is distinctly specified? The office of the Holy Spirit. What is his office? That's his job. That's his work. That's what he does. Remember in John 3, Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the wind. You can't see it, but you can feel its effects. You can see what it does. And this is another very, very important principle when it comes to understanding the Holy Spirit. If we want to understand the Holy Spirit, we need to study the work of the Holy Spirit. Because that will tell us what we need to know about him. So, so far, we've, we've discovered three key aspects of the Holy Spirit. One, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery not revealed. Two, that the work of the Holy Spirit is clearly revealed. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. His work is to reveal Christ. In my book, I go through pretty much every statement in the Bible that talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's quite a list. So there is a lot revealed in the Bible about the work of the Holy Spirit. By the time we get the end of this list, one thing is very clear. To do the work that the, Holy, that the Bible describes the Holy Spirit doing, he must be a separate person. It can't be Christ and it can't be the Father. It must be a separate individual. Let me show you a couple of my favorite verses. Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 32. The God of our fathers has raised up Jesus, this is Peter speaking to the Jews, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted to his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and repentance of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom the Lord hath given to them that obey him. So Peter is saying we are witnesses of the, the, the life, death and, and sufferings and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so also is the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ, how can the Holy Spirit be a witness of the sufferings and death of Christ and the life of Christ? Clearly, for to be a witness, you need to be a separate person from Christ. This verse was a real clincher for me when I first, when I first read it. It just hit me one day as I was reading. The Holy Spirit is a witness. So he must be a separate individual to the Father and the Son. What does Ellen White have to say about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Cumbered, note that word, cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was for their interest that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor on earth. No one could have any advantage because of his location or personal contact with Christ. By the Spirit, the Saviour would be accessible to all. In this sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. Now the context of this statement is Christ is speaking to the, the disciples and he's saying that he's going to leave and he's going to send the comforter. And Ellen White tells us very clearly here that Christ was cumbered with humanity. Now, what does it mean to be cumbered with something? You're restricted, inhibited. Now, this clearly tells us that when Christ took on humanity, he gave up his omnipresence. He could not be present everywhere at once like he could before. He was cumbered with humanity. Now, the anti-Trinitarians run into a problem here because if, Christ, if the Holy Spirit is the mind of Christ, the omnipresence of, of God, then how is Christ cumbered by humanity? He's not. He's not cumbered at all because... The Holy Spirit is the omnipresence of God. He was before the incarnation and he was after. So this, makes, this statement at all makes no sense at all if you believe the Holy Spirit is part of Christ. 
But if the Holy Spirit is a separate person representing Christ, then this makes perfect sense. Christ is covered with humanity, so now the Holy Spirit takes on the role of revealing and representing Christ. Now let's read another statement that really confirms this. Of the Spirit, Jesus said, He will glorify me. The Saviour came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love. So the Spirit was to glorify Christ by, by revealing his grace to the world. Now this is a very, very key thing that I want you to understand. When Christ came to this earth, he came to reveal the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Christ was the Father to us on earth. Christ revealed what the Father was like perfectly. But when Christ went back to heaven, the Holy Spirit took on the role of revealing Christ. Now, in order for the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ, he needs to be a separate person. It can't be Christ. Can't, Christ can't reveal himself. It does not make sense. In fact, Jesus said in John 5, verse 13 and 31, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So if Christ is the Holy Spirit, he's bearing testimony of himself, glorifying himself, revealing himself. If I was to stand up and, and testify of myself and tell you how good a person I am, you're not really going to listen to me, are you? But if someone else stood up and said, testified of me, of, then you might listen to that person, right? And it's the same with Christ. Christ does not reveal himself. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ. Christ said of the Holy Spirit, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he will speak, and he will show you things to come. And he will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. This is a very important key. The Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. He reveals Christ. There's no text in the Bible that says to worship the Holy Spirit that I'm aware of. And that's because the role of the Holy Spirit is not to be worshipped. The role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ. So the Holy Spirit, in fact, his role is to personify Christ. Now, I have not made this word up. This word comes straight from inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the comforter in Christ's name. He personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. What does it mean to personify someone? You take on the person's characteristics. You talk like them. You act like them. You are that person for all intents and purposes. So the Holy Spirit takes on Christ. The Holy Spirit, this is another spirit prophecy statement, the Holy Spirit comes to the world as Christ's representative. It not only speaks the truth, but it is the truth, the faithful and true witness. It is the great searcher of hearts and is acquainted with the characters of all. Now, who else is the truth and the true, faithful and true witness. Who else is that? It's Christ. So the Holy Spirit is taking on the names of Christ because the Holy Spirit is Christ's representative. Well, what about this one? We want the Holy Spirit, which is Christ. Now, this is a new statement that has come out recently since the Elamite estate has released all Elamite's unpublished letters. But we have no problem with this statement. The Holy Spirit to us is Christ. He's Christ's representative. He personifies Christ. Therefore, to us, the Holy Spirit is Christ. The unity in the Godhead is such we cannot split them up into separate little pieces. They work in perfect harmony together. And here's a few more. The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Now, just in case someone has some doubts to the authenticity of this statement in evangelism, have a look at this. This is Elamite's original handwriting. The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It's in her own pen and ink. And in fact, in, in the appendix of my book, I have a whole stack of scans of Elamite's original statements and, and manuscripts validating all these, many of these key statements. And here's another one. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is much, just as much a person as God is a person, person is walking these grounds that God is our keeper and our helper and one more the Holy Spirit must be a divine person else he could not search out the secrets hidden in the mind of God 
I could, I could share you more, but time is against us. But there's one more statement that I really want to share with you. And that is this one here. Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding on man's behalf. But the Spirit pleads for us, not as does Christ, who presents his blood shed from the foundation of the world. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise and thanksgiving. The gratitude that flows from our lips is the result of the spirits striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening music in the soul. Now, can you get a clearer statement than that regarding the Holy Spirit and Christ as two separate individuals? We've got Christ interceding before the Father at the throne. And we've got the Holy Spirit who's also interceding, but in a different way. The Holy Spirit intercedes by drawing out our prayers and penitence. He works here on our hearts. This is very clear. The Holy Spirit works and Christ works. They have separate roles. Now this quote makes no sense at all if you believe that the Holy Spirit and Christ are the same being. So why did I leave the anti-Trinitarian movement? The evidence just didn't stack up when I put it to the test with an open mind. But I'm actually jumping ahead of myself here because there is more. There was Before I was ready to make a complete change, I needed to answer another question. And that was, what about the pioneers? Was the, the, the Godhead part of the fundamental beliefs that were established early on in, in the history of our church? But this will be the subject of our next presentation. It's a fascinating journey back into the history of our pioneers, so don't miss it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for revealing yourself clearly to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that clearly reveals to Christ to us. And I pray that as we seek to understand you more, that you will reveal yourself to us, not to satisfy our curiosity, but so that we can have a deeper love for you and be ultimately ready when you come back to take us home. Bless us now and be with us and bring us all back safely for this next session, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.